Onoda said this was his fate. To be stubborn. <laughs> yeah. And to be uh, lost for 20 odd years. Yeah, I mean, he is like the Japanese version of Bear Grylls times a thousand. No, Bear Grylls is a sissy. But that's what I mean, times a thousand. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> times a thousand sissies. I mean, a thousand sissies, that's uh, not a force you want to reckon with. No, that's a lot of slapping. I've been to the gay bar on a Friday night, <laughs> and that's a scary prospect. Welcome to the Compendium, an assembly of Japanese loyalty, honour, and just plain old stubbornness, along with an unbroken promise. Ooh, is this a belligerent samurai that we're dealing with here? A belligerent samurai? Well, you're, you're on the right track. Samurais do come into it. Ooh, I love a samurai story. Do you? Okay. Well, before we get into that, I am Adam Cox, the host for this week. And I'm your co-host for this week, Kyle Reesey. And you are listening to The Compendium, an assembly of fascinating and intriguing things. We are a weekly variety podcast where I, Kyle Reese, ordinarily tell Adam Cox all about a story that I think he'll find both fascinating and intriguing, from groundbreaking events to unforgettable people. We do it all in a simple one hour-ish episode, giving you just enough information for you to be the star of any social gathering. But I guess this week again, you're in that driving seat. I am. I'm back again. It's becoming a trend now. It's my one month show. Thing. Debut. Yeah. No, not debut. One month. Thing I do. <laughs> one month a thing that you do. That's not the only thing you do, just once a month. <laughs> what does <laughs> that know. even mean? <laughs> I don't know where that's going. There's an insult in there somewhere. I'm sure there is. But let's move on. Before we get into the main topic for today, um, any latest news for us? I do. I've got one thing. So I've not been that well recently. I do suffer from a bit of a sensitive stomach. But I found out that taking Imodium, you know Imodium, mm-hmm. right, to kind of help stop with the, uh, well, you know. The pooping. Yeah, with the pooping. Did you know that it's actually an opioid? Really? Yeah. So remember when we were watching that show? What was that show on Netflix about the opioid crisis in America? Uh, Painkiller. Painkiller. And one of the side effects was that people were having chronic constipation. Right, yeah. And I didn't realize this, but Imodium is actually an opioid. And it's designed to interact with only the opioid receptors in your digestive tract to slow down your intestines. And basically, scientists were like, hey, you know, like that anti-diarrhea medication, heroin, um, well... We can just make a version of that without the pesky side effects that get you high. And what they've done is they've managed to kind of separate the thing that makes you constipated, that interacts with your digestive system, in the heroin, while removing the high factor from it. Really? Yeah. That's a thing. That is a thing. So it's an opioid. I had no idea. Mind is blown. Oh, okay. Well, that's all the latest things for this week for me. What have you got for us? Um... Well, just just a little story. Have you ever gone past a sunflower field and thought, I would love to get naked right now? Um, no, yes, no. <laughs> Is this a trick? Um, Are you trying to expose me? <laughs> no, I can honestly say no. I've never walked past a sunflower field and felt the need to get naked. Well, um, you are alone in that. Who's getting naked without me? (laughs) What's happening? So a family farm in the UK has had to go to um, new lengths to basically stop uh, visitors from stripping off in their sunflower field. For what reason? Well, the field, it's a pick-your-own sunflower, so people are supposed to go there and they can have photos. They've got these props of pianos and bathtubs. So Interesting. It's supposed to be, you know, a nice place to visit with a family day out. Yeah. Uh, but what's happened is that the British public are stripping off and for the gram are getting naked to ha- show a picture of them like, I don't know, tastefully naked in a field of sunflowers. Oh, God. I guess if you're going to be naked, the way to make it tasteful is to be surrounded by a flurry of sunflowers. Yeah. And so there's like this kid walking around and apparently he was like shocked to find this woman that was just wearing a thong. 
And so they had to put out these signs that said, please do not get naked. Okay, I hope these are people that are younger than us. I don't know. I guess anyone, each to their own. Um, but what is interesting is since they've put up these signs, mm -hmm. they've had a lot of requests of people going like, well, can I come to your farm and strip off? Is he saying like, no, like I'm not condoning this. This isn't a thing. This is something that's happening against my will. Well, do you know My what? cows are offended. <laughs> They they don't actually go into whether he's accepting those bookings, mm -hmm. um, but maybe if the price is right. Ah, so a little business venture there for him. Yeah, so if you're in the Portsmouth area, mm -hmm. then uh, look up that farm. Do it. Yeah. Nice. Okay. What are you serving up today? Well, Kyle, let's start off with a question. Ooh. Have you ever been at work and been asked to do a particular task, such as a really in-depth presentation, that you need to present back to a client or internally, whatever. And this presentation is going to take you all week, lots of research. You've been stressing about it. And the day finally comes that you need to present it back. And your boss goes to you, oh, don't worry about that. It's no longer needed. Oh, God, yes. Did I not tell you about Did that? Did I forget to tell you about that? Yeah. All those hours that you put in. Yeah, that happens all the time. In fact, <laughs> weekly. Weekly. Well, then you must be very frustrated by that. Oh, yes. Well, compare yourself then to the Japanese holdout soldiers of World War II, who still believed the war was going on for almost three decades than it actually was. These are Japanese soldiers? Japanese soldiers. Did they not get the memo? Well, there were attempts to tell them, but didn't quite go to plan. What? So these guys were hiding out in the jungle, living off coconuts, and were still carrying out war tactics to fight for their country. That's mental. How did they not get the message, though? I guess that's what this story is all about. Is what this story is all about. Because in today's compendium, we are going to explore the last of the Japanese holdouts, a group of tough and incredibly strong-willed soldiers from World War II that were tasked with going into hiding to cause trouble for their enemies as part of their strategy to take down the allies of World War II. Mm. We will learn a little bit about the samurai code, which should also help us understand why these soldiers did what they did for so long. Kamikaze! Do you not remember Worms? Um, is that what they did? No, the little 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 game on the on the on the telly thing on the thing. Yeah, little worms, and then they would like kind of like one of their moves was like the kamikaze, and it'd be like a little suicide mission, and you'd see them put on their little Japanese little banner, <laughs> and then they would wind themselves up, and then the worm would fire into kind of like an enemy kind of ship or something, and then it would explode them. And no, I didn't. No, I never played. And that. imagine that might have been part of the samurai code. Anyway. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll talk a about that. A bit of a segue again. there. A bit sorry. of a segue. But yeah, you're, you're on the right track with Kamikaze. We're going to talk about that as well. Wow. Let's do it. Okay, so we start our story in 1939 with the outbreak of World War II. It was a war that would bring pretty much every country into battle, led by the Allies, the big three being the UK, the Soviet Union, and later the United States. And they were fighting against the Axis powers, which was Nazi Germany, the Kingdom of Italy, and the Empire of Japan. Ooh. Random fact. Did you know that Finland was on Germany's side? What, they were on the Axis side? The yeah. Axis of evil? Yeah. Finland? Finland. You know, they, you think they're kind of neutral, inoffensive, but yeah. actually they were, yeah, the enemies for us at least. That's complete news to me. Yeah, that's why I, I was shocked. Shocked. Shocked, I tell you. Shocked. We're not that shocked. But anyway, um, the war really kicked off for Japan in 1941. It was the 7th of December that year where Japan invaded Thailand. They attacked Malaya, which is now Malaysia. And I think that was part of the UK empire at the time. Singapore and Hong Kong. And one of the ways the Japanese were able to carry out so many successful attacks in succession was how they approached war. And they drew upon the ancient ways of the samurai and their code of honor. Ooh, unagi. Unagi, salmon skin roll. <laughs> For those that watch Friends. But yes, as I was saying, those codes, one of those codes was called Bushido. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing about Bushido is it's a moral code where the closest way I could describe it, I guess, in Western culture is chivalry. Okay. Um, but it's a fair bit more than that. It's like a set of rules that guides the behavior and mindset of Japanese samurai long ago. It was all about honor, courage, and living a disciplined life. And this code became super important during Japan's involvement in multiple wars during the first half of the 20th century. Wow, okay. During those times, Japan wanted to use Bushido to boost the spirit of its soldiers. They wanted to make the war seem like this pure and cleansing act, okay? 
And they believed that dying in battle was a duty, not something to be feared. Yeah, sure. Like a, it's an honor. It's an honor to die for your country almost. Yeah, it's like a, a morale booster. Like, don't be worried. This is actually a good oh, thing. Oh, it's a morale booster. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say it as a morale booster, but I mean, I would willing, I'm willing to die for a cause, but I, I'm not, I'm not going to feel good about it. No, I mean, that was sarcasm. Oh, right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, but they, they thought it would essentially give the soldiers, they call it a spiritual shield that mm-hmm. allowed them to fight until the very end, essentially. Sure. One way of instilling this into the Japanese soldiers came from Japan's prime minister at the time, um, Hideki Tojo, I think it was. Mm-hmm. He had also been a military leader and he had a unique way of motivating his troops. He'd literally slap the soldiers' faces. Oh, really? Uh, believing it was some form of training. Oh, right. Yeah. Sounds more like abuse. A little bit, but hey, it kind of made them the men that they were. Oh, right. And so one thing you may have heard of is it's kamikaze pilots, a bit like the worms things you just said. Mm -hmm. Um, But these suicidal attacks were how Japanese pilots, they crashed their planes into enemy ships. And in fact, 3,000 Japanese pilots and 7,000 American, Australian and British personnel lost their lives from these kamikaze attacks. Really? Damn. And that was all driven by Bushido as part of that. Right. It sounds like a bit of propaganda, though, because I don't think that, like, the benefit there is that you are having a plane that's going to be crashing into a enemy ship or an enemy kind of tank or whatever. And that's probably way more reliable than trying to shoot them down with, like, bullets and stuff. So yeah, I, I think so. it's just a bit of propaganda to kind of try to make it seem like it's an honourable death. I wouldn't be surprised. Exactly. You're doing something for the greater cause, the emperor, essentially. mm Now, of course, if you didn't follow Bushido, i.e. you decided to surrender, then essentially you were deemed a coward and you lost all respect. This is why, unfortunately, some prisoners of war weren't treated that well because they were seen as having forfeited their honour. If you didn't fight to the death or were captured or even worse, you had no choice but to surrender, well, actually, you Mm. brought shame among your family. Right, I see. So is this partly what might have then kind of facilitated the holdout? That comes into the whole Bushido. The salmon skin roll. The salmon skin roll. In fact, in some instances, families wish that you'd rather have died than come back a prisoner of war or something like that. Which I think is is kind of crazy because it's a real mindset change that you'd have to probably force yourself into that kind of adrenaline to take yourself out and the enemy. Yeah, well, I think the prospect of just dying will give you that adrenaline boost Mm. by just the act of doing it, getting mobilized to point your ship or point your your plane at the enemy and then just go full pelt. Yeah, I can't imagine that. That feels weird. Oh, and knowing that it's just, it's going to be over. I would suck at war. Yeah, me too. I think I'm not, I'm not cut out for war. Good job we're too old for the draft, right? Mm, Maybe give it another 10 years. Do you reckon? I think so. We might have to do, I don't know, some toilet cleaning. (laughs) I don't know. Okay. <laughs> um, now, we all know that Japan is pretty much the main reason why the United States joined World War II. The US had remained neutral up until um, Japan hit their military base in Hawaii, Guam, and of course, the Pearl Harbor bombings in 1941. Mm-hmm. And the Japanese forces also invaded the Philippines, which happened to be a US colony at the time. And so the Japanese were able to capture the islands and quickly overpowered the American and Filipino troops stationed there. So despite the Japanese occupation, you still have the Americans and Filipinos resisting the Japanese, and they're trying their best to fight back where they could. And there was a battle in October 1944, which marked the beginning of the liberation of the Philippines and the US forces with Filipino support for a series of battles to take back the islands. Mm -hmm. And so it was during these attacks that a number of Japanese men were sent to the Philippine islands to hamper enemy attacks and carry out guerrilla warfare. Right, I see. Um, so I thought, actually, first thing, do you know much about guerrilla warfare? Um, n- other, no, I don't, actually. That's fine. Guerrilla warfare is a bit unconventional in that it usually involves small groups of military to carry out smaller attacks that would hamper or cause serious problems for the enemy. Things like burning crops, affecting agriculture, running water, you know, ways of life, taking out police, or perhaps being close enough to spy and feed intelligence back to their base. Right, so where does the term guerrilla come into it? That I don't know. So just doing a quick Google search, it says that the term guerrilla warfare comes from the Spanish word for war, which is guerra, and refers to a type of 
warfare fought by irregulars in fast-moving, small-scale kind of actions against orthodox military or kind of police forces. Yeah, that so makes it's sense. about the origin of the word, I guess, which is interesting. Spanish. Yeah, mm. interesting. Yeah. So these men that were carrying out this type of warfare, they were specifically recruited to take up this role for Japan. And it would have been a massive honor at the time to go do this. And these men, they'd been given serious survival training and strict orders to remain in hiding until they were told otherwise. Mm -hmm. And so they went off and started stealthily causing havoc for a lot of the, the allies across a lot of the Filipino islands. But fortunately for us, the war comes crashing down on Hitler as he commits suicide in April 1945, which leads to Germany surrendering in May and ending the war in Europe. The war, however, still goes on with Japan. And it's not until August 1945 that the US drops a nuclear bomb on Hiroshima, killing 80,000 people within minutes. Mm. And then a second nuclear bomb is targeted towards Nagasaki, this time killing 120,000 people. Wow. Um, I mean, I knew about the bombs, but I never knew, I guess, the devastation that it caused. Yeah, it was horrendous. Yeah, and and those deaths, that doesn't even take into consideration those that would have died from radiation poisoning Mm. afterwards or any kind of other impacts from the bombings. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, horrendous attacks. You can totally understand why we don't want to go there again. So given the severity of these attacks, it's less than a month later on September the 2nd, Japan formally surrenders, ending World War II. The United States leads the Allies in the occupation and rehabilitation of the Japanese state, which leads to military and political reform, amongst other things. But whilst this is all happening, as you can imagine, telling all the Japanese troops that were stationed overseas, and there was about three million of them, Mm -hmm. to surrender and come home, maybe wasn't at the top of the army's list, and certainly not an easy task to get this message out to absolutely everyone. Sure. Given that Some of these men, they didn't really know exactly where they were. They know they're on the island, but don't know exactly where to contact them on the island because they're in the jungle. Oh, I see, I see. I mean, don't get me wrong, Japan did try. Uh, Many stragglers were captured and were sent home, while hundreds went into hiding rather than surrender or commit suicide because this was considered the better alternative than going home and bringing shame among their family. Mm -hmm. Um, Some believed that they would go to prison, so wanted to avoid capture. And then there were a whole bunch that died as a result of starvation or sickness. Oh, God. Most of the men, however, that were in hiding were discovered in the 1940s. A few are found in the 1950s, one in the 60s, and then four men are found in the 1970s. So these numbers, these are very small numbers, but in comparison to the numbers that are out there, are these like just them just scratching the surface or are there only just a very few number of these? Well, these are all the reported cases, okay? So... There's going to be some that probably aren't as well-known sort of stories. There are a few others which we'll, we'll touch on that may or may not have happened after that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think largely in the decade that the war ended, most of them were kind of picked up and sent back home. Interesting. But it was just that these stragglers were still out there. Yeah. And so in the 1970s, that was when the last Japanese soldier was to be found. And his name was Hiro Onoda in 1974. What and a that, name. Yeah, it's a really nice name, Hero. Yeah. Um, And that's who our story is about today. Okay, great. Hi, Hero. Hi, Hero. Um, So let's find out a little bit about his backstory, why he was able to survive so long, largely undetected, and what eventually caused him to come out of hiding 28 years and 210 days after World War II ended. Okay. Wow, that's a long time. Mm. So here at Anoda, his life began in the village of, I'm going to hopefully say this correctly, Kamakawa okay. in Wakayama. I, it's a great pronunciation. Um, which Excellent is, Japanese. Thank you so much. Um, it's a, well, Wakayama, I think, is a prefecture, which uh, is in South Japan. It's a bit like a state or a county in the UK. Mm-hmm. Um, so he was born in 1922. He was always a strong-willed character. And in an interview that he gave, he said he was always defiant and stubborn in everything he did. Mm -hmm. He was born like that. Okay, so he's primed to be a, what do you call it? A Japanese holdout. He's so suited to that. He said, like, this this was his fate, is what Mm. he says. To be stubborn. (laughs) Yeah. And to be Uh, lost for 20 odd years. Yeah, I mean, he is like the Japanese version of Bear Grylls times a thousand. No, Bear Grylls is a sissy. 
This is what I mean, times a thousand. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> times a thousand sissies. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a thousand sissies, that's uh, not a force you want to reckon with. No, that's a lot of slapping. I've been to the gay bar on a Friday night, <laughs> and that's a scary prospect. It is for you. No. <laughs> Um, anyway, so at just six years old, uh, he got into a fight with a friend and things got pretty serious. He started waving a knife around and accidentally hurt his friend with the knife. His mother, as you might imagine, was not happy. Mm -hmm. Um, and so like most mothers, she wanted to take serious action. Um, I mean, you were naughty as a child, weren't you, Kyle? So what kind of things would you, would your mum make you do if you got into trouble? So I would get the slipper thrown at me. Uh Uh-huh. I would uh, be grounded. Right. Oh, God. She would shout, Uh like, a lot. Yeah. But these are all kind of rudimentary things, little rudimentary measures that you place on children who are naughty, especially growing up in the 80s. Yeah, these are not uncommon or unheard of things. So what did uh, Mama Hero do? Well. Oh, God. uh, His mother was so troubled by his behavior Mm -hmm. that she just couldn't tolerate him any longer. Okay. Okay. She took him to the family shrine and suggested a thug like him should commit Hara Kiri. I'm assuming that's like suicide. Yeah. That's horrible. Yeah, well, it's a ritual suicide which involves cutting the belly and disemboweling yourself. Ooh, so he can bring honour onto his mother and father. Well, not so much that. He just needs to go do this because he's a bad little boy. But at the age of six, Kyle. Mm. I guess it's like a threat of the equivalent of like, oh, the boogeyman's going to come get you or... You should run away or... But being given a knife to go, come on, come get oh, she actually gave him a knife. Well, even having that conversation with a child is mm. terrible. That is some tough love. And what family has a family shrine? I don't know. Can we have a family shrine? Um, yeah, right. Put it on the list. Would it, would it be RuPaul as our, like, as our queen, as our, as our god? I don't think so. Unless that's what you want. Isn't that what you want? No. Anyway. Back to the story. Okay. So once again, this Japanese honor is a common thread in their culture, as we know. And with his mum believing he's such a troublemaker and that he should end his life, Anoda couldn't bring it upon himself to go through with it, and rightly so. At 20, Anoda has a brief stint with the Tajima Yoko Trading Company in Wuhan before he enlists in the Imperial Japanese Army. He was singled out a suitable candidate for the school in Tokyo, a crucial training ground for intelligence agents. Here he received the training he would need in order to go into the jungles, things like propaganda, sabotage, martial arts, and of course, how to carry out guerrilla warfare. His mission in 1944 was to go to Lubang, uh, which is an island 93 miles southwest of the Filipino capital, Manila. Anoda, along with a small team, were tasked with obstructing American advances across the Pacific on that island. Mm -hmm. So Anoda's orders were given to him by Major Yoshimi Taniguchi. (laughs) And they were pretty clear, and I'm going to read them out. Okay. You are absolutely forbidden to die by your own hand. It may take three years, it may take five, but whatever happens will come back for you. Until then, so long as you have one soldier, you are continue to lead him. You may have to live on coconuts. If that's the case, live on coconuts. Under no circumstances are you to give up your life voluntarily. Wow, okay. Because they might be needed as kamikaze pilots or something like that. Well, I think they're just like, you're not giving up. You need to fight this right, okay. war through sort of thing. We've, yeah. got, we've got a job to do. I mean, these are very explicit orders. Exactly. Very explicit. So once concealed in the jungle... Anoda and his team, they basically pull together and his team is made up of three other soldiers, Private Yuchi Akatsu, Corporal Shoichi Shimada, and Private First Class Kinshichi Kozuka. Wow, check out your pronunciation. I mean, I could have You're got smashing that. smashing it. Well, it sounds like it. It does sound like it. I have no idea to verify whether or not it's correct or not. Make it till you make it. Okay. <laughs> so these guys, they were completely cut off from the rest of their wider team and they were surrounded by their enemy. Anoda and his team lived very close together, constructing bamboo huts, living off only a very few amount of supplies. They only had the clothes that they were wearing, a small amount of rice, and each had a gun with limited ammunition. They turned to guerrilla warfare tactics to fight the Allies where possible, which would once in a while allow them to kill a civilian's cow for food. Mm -hmm. The rest of the time, they rationed their supplies so meticulously 
that they pretty much just relied on coconuts, bananas, and the jungle's resources for food and drink. Okay. Over time, other groups stationed on the island are captured or are killed, but Anoda's team managed to work really well together and they evade capture. Mm -hmm. In the autumn of that year, 1945, not long after the war has ended, they do notice that the island's activities has slowed down a little bit, um, but that doesn't mean to them that the war is over. They just think, oh, it's just gone a little bit quiet. Mm -hmm. Anoda and his team would continue to fight the war for many years, attacking Lubang's civilian population. And this would cause the local police force, as well as Filipino and American search parties, to actually go out and look for them and go like, come on, guys, it's over, go mm. home. Um, but the locals had little choice but get used to it because there was basically a, a bunch of wild Japanese soldiers that could burst out of the forest at any point with a gun, steal your cow and kill you. Yeah, you don't want to reason with that, right? You don't want to risk that happening either. No, exactly. So you just have to kind of keep yourself to yourself and mm. make sure, you know, look behind your back, where you're mm. going, all Stay that sort of stuff. Way. Yeah. And to be fair, Anoda and his team, they didn't really help themselves because, as I said, like every time they would attack a local, it would cause another search party. And this would then feed into their paranoia um, because they believe these search parties are actually enemy spies dressed in civilian clothes, ready to hunt them out. And so that kind of made them withdraw even more into the jungle mm -hmm. and kind of, you know, keep hidden. And these guys, their paranoia became so bad that even when a plane flew over the island, dropping leaflets to tell the soldiers that the war was over, they didn't buy it. Really? Yeah, because Anoda had, I guess, studied um, propaganda and he thought this was some way that the Americans were doing it as a hoax, essentially, to get them out of the jungle. He just... Well, that's what they did as well. They, mm. they did do that. Oh, did they? Yeah, they would drop leaflets on to various civilian areas, telling them all sorts of propaganda. In fact, when they dropped the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they also dropped loads of leaflets as well. Really? I did not know that. Yeah. So understandably then, you can see why Anoda perhaps wouldn't buy this because it's happened before. Mm -hmm. Newspapers were also left for them. Um, so it would have news about the war being over and other modern day events, such as like the Olympics that were going on. Mm -hmm. Still didn't buy it uh family members wrote letters and they took photos and they were dropped over and even some of the family members would visit the jungle and would speak over loudspeakers really wow um but they're like oh they've they've managed to claim that it's a good fake it's a good fake of my mum yeah or it's a good fake of my wife either that or they think they're being held against their will ah uh, right thing. okay sure so, so it's a trap i mean they did have very explicit orders not to i guess take their own life but also was one of the orders not to surrender Essentially, yeah, because that's part of, you know, you're going against Bushido if you do that. Mm. So Anoda and his team, they stood strong. They were not deviating from their plan. And as the major Yoshimi Taniguchi said to them, mm. he would come and get them when the war's over. And that's what they continued to believe. Well, most of them anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1949, one of the team, Akatsu, um, had had enough. It's been about five years at this point that he's been in hiding and he takes the decision to leave without telling the others in the group. And he surrenders to the Filipino forces. Why? Uh, just because he's had enough? He's, he's had enough. He's exhausted. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I can't handle two nights in a tent. Well, he's been there years. Exactly. Wow. So, yeah, five years. Good on him. Um, but it still takes him, after leaving the group, another six months before he actually hands himself in. Right. I think he was still quite nervous about doing it because, you know shame and everything else that that would bring and also he could be put in prison he didn't know what was going to happen he could be shot yeah so with akatsu out of the group anoda shimada and kazuka became even more cautious because they feel like well actually if if akatsu is interrogated he could reveal details about their location Ooh, and everything yeah. else mm -hmm. so again another layer of paranoia mm. Over the years, Anoda and his men carried out armed raids on farmers, many of which actually tragically resulted in deaths. So part of the tactics that they were employed to use was to take back the island, and that meant fighting locals, threatening them, setting fire to their houses and killing them. And in one instance, they murdered a person by decapitating them, oh God. and their body parts were found in separate oh places. God. So yeah, they were pretty tough and some nasty things that they did yeah brutal as well mm. in june 1953 shimada was wounded during a skirmish um his leg was a skirmish what's that uh, a bit of a fight between the local police forces or right, civilians okay. so like a scuffle 
Well, more of, of like a shootout. So not so not a scuffle, more than a scuffle, less than a kerfuffle. <laughs> um, it's a... A skirmish. A skirmish. Yeah. Um, so, you know, he basically got shot in the leg. Um, it did get better, but he did die about a year later mm-hmm. following another skirmish on the beach with the police. And so that then encouraged another search party to try and find these guys. And that just left Kazuka and Anoda, really, a team of two. And even though they were a team of two, part of the thing that their major said to them was, even if you only got one soldier to lead, Mm -hmm. you continue to lead that soldier. You continue to lead them. And that's what they did. So what was like life like for them? Like what were they, did they have access to clothing? What were they wearing after five years? Like what state were, was their attire in? Were they just like covered in like black paint? Like I imagine you're kind of trying to stay camouflaged in the jungle Mm. and your head's just poking out every now and again. Um, what did they wear? Did they just have a loincloth? A loincloth. Well, did they, they have a uniform? Like? Do you know what? That, that's a good point. They don't go into that. Or I didn't read about that. But I know that when Anoda does come out of hiding, his clothes are in pretty good condition really? considering. Wow. So he took very good care of his uniform because that's obviously represented his country. Yeah. Um, so perhaps he did take that off and wear a loincloth or whatever mm. to kind of you're going to get sweaty in the jungle. Yeah, yeah. This is like his Sunday best, which is his <laughs> uniform. But the rest of the time, he's just wearing like a bear skin. I would, yeah, I think so anyway. Could be wrong, but I think that's the case. So Kazuka and Anoda being the remaining two, they largely remain hidden for another 18 years after Shimada's death. In fact, all the failed search parties and attempts to find them over the years leads to an official declaration that those two soldiers are pronounced dead in 1959. Wow. It's only when Kazuka is killed following another skirmish with Filipino patrol and his body is found that people start to think, oh, maybe Anoda could be alive. Mm. News about this reaches a college dropout called Norio Suzuki. He's described as a bit of a hippie, which I think is a bit odd when you think of a Japanese hippie. Because you think of long hair, straggly, that kind of thing. And Japanese are always so well Mm -hmm. kept. Um, But this was the 70s after all. And he was traveling around several countries. And he he told his friends he was on a mission to find a noda, a panda, and the abominable snowman (laughs) in that specific order. So all these three mythical creatures, including this, (laughs) this this hidden soldier. Is a panda a mythical creature? Uh... Well, like, is a, pan- a panda's not from Japan, though. A panda's from China. True. So maybe he's like, he's only ever heard about pandas and he's only ever heard about the abominable snowman. True. And he's only ever heard about that an odor. An yeah. odor is out there. Yeah. So I think he's classing them three as these three mythical creatures, which is cute. It's cute, cute. I like what you've done there. I like it. I think it's, it's a good mission in life. So Suzuki sets out to go to the island to find an odor. And... Weirdly, it only takes him four days to find him, which is much quicker than any other search party out there. And on their first encounter, Suzuki was actually really lucky to survive and not get shot by an odor. If it wasn't for the fact that Suzuki was wearing socks and sandals, an odor said that he probably would have shot him. Why? Because the locals, they would never be seen wearing that. Is that a very Japanese thing to do? I guess it is. Like okay, when you yeah. imagine, have these images of these samurais with these big gorgeous gowns they're wearing sandals and socks yeah and the filipino what a way to ruin a perfectly great outfit i know (laughs) it's weird because growing up um wearing like sandals and socks was like blasphemous you couldn't do that but now it's okay to wear sliders and socks yeah yeah i've I've got into that habit as well i know it's a shame (laughs) i pray for you it'll happen to you as well (laughs) With um, you, it'll be Birkenstocks and sandals. Maybe. And, sorry, Birkenstocks and socks. Maybe. but um, So that was the giveaway for him because he was like, yeah, the locals would never wear that. Mm-hmm. And so Suki tried to persuade Anoda to come home and that the war was over. But Anoda was, as we know, very stubborn and wasn't going to give in that easily and didn't necessarily take Suzuki's word straight away. But actually, I think there's something in one of the books on Anoda whereby he said that there was a certain Japanese expression that Suzuki must have done, um, which made him think, actually, maybe this guy is genuine. Like what? What was it? 
didn't say what, but there's something that he did, his demeanor and the way that he kind of portrayed himself. He's like, actually, yeah, you are Japanese. You mean well, there's truth in what you're saying. Right, right, yeah. Anoda continued to stick to his instincts and refused to leave the jungle on Lebang Island, as for him, the war was still going on. But Suzuki and Anoda, they bonded enough for Anoda to reveal that he had only surrender when his commander, Major Yoshimi Taniguchi, would come and get him, like he had promised almost 30 years ago. Was he even still alive? Uh, we're about to find out. Oh, God. Um, so hearing this, Suzuki travels back to Japan. He takes photos of him and Anoda as proof, and he manages to track down Anoda's former commander, Major Taniguchi. Mm-hmm. Uh, he had surrendered long ago, and he was now a bookseller. Oh, he surrendered. Mm. Cheeky bugger. I know, right? Suzuki convinces Taniguchi to come with him, and they travel to Lebang. And on March the 9th, 1974, Suzuki and Taniguchi meet in Oda, where the major reads the orders that state all combat activity was to be ceased, and that Anoda could finally be relieved of duty. He didn't think that he was a plant or... Yeah, he believed him because that was what the major said that he would come and do. Mm. Oh, Although he did get a little sidetracked. Why? Well, he, it took him 28 years to visit him. Yeah, that's true. So maybe not that He was busy major. setting up a bookshop. Yeah. Does that take 28 years though? <laughs> anyway. I guess he just forgot about him. Right? I guess so. Maybe he just thought like, come on, he must have come back by now. Yeah. He didn't literally take my words, did he? Well, you did. He did. So when Anoda is given this news, he's obviously shocked. Uh, he can't quite believe it. Not only had Japan lost the war, but he'd been in hiding all that time for essentially mm. no reason at all. Yeah. And he describes how he felt as he heard this news. And I'm going to read it because I think this was in perhaps one of his autobiographies. Mm -hmm. He reveals, we really lost the war. How could they have been so sloppy? <laughs> Suddenly, everything went black. A storm raged inside me. I felt like a fool for having been so tense and cautious on the way here. Worse than that, what had I been doing all these years? Mm. Had the war really ended 30 years ago? If it had, then what had Shimada and Kazuka died for? If what was happening was true, wouldn't it have been better if I had died with them? Yeah. Well, so, no, not that he died, but yeah, that the feel of like, what a waste of a life. Yeah. The realization that you've done this all for nothing almost. Yeah. Yeah. And you've possibly missed out on having a family. You've probably missed out on the joys of living. Do mm. you know what I mean? And he lost his friends and they, he could, lost have had his a, friends, they yeah. could have had a life. So really sad. And it takes some time for that news to sink in. He does hand in his sword a functioning rifle he had kept in good order all these years, 500 rounds of ammunition and several hand grenades, as well as the dagger his mum had given to him in 1944 to kill himself if he was captured. Wow. She was hell-bent on him killing himself. Yeah, she was. Is she still alive? What about his family? Oh, I don't know, actually. That's a good question. How old was he when he finally surrendered? So he was born in 22. Mm -hmm. He... Surrendered in 1974, so he is... So he was 52 years old. 52 years old. There's a chance that his mum and dad would have been alive Possibly. if they were young enough. But he spent over half his life in the jungle at this point. He did. They probably wouldn't even recognise him. Mm. He'll probably come back and his mum would have been like, oh, so you didn't kill yourself. <laughs> yeah. Shouldn't you be dead? <laughs> yeah. I thought I got rid of you years ago. I know. Poor Noda. Yeah, that's a, that's a real sad story, like mm. a, a wasted life or almost nothing. Mm. And what's even worse is like, it's, it's because you take the words of your commander so seriously, right? That's gospel. Mm. That's what you do. And to him, like the war ended a few years later, he forgot all about Hero and he probably never crossed his mind again. Probably Yet, not. Yet he sat there in the jungle all these years, loyal to his commander and this country, yeah. And these countries, the betrayal is multifaceted, right? Mm. Yeah. I would, I'd be gutted. Gutted. And I wouldn't know how I'd be able to assimilate back into society after that. He did struggle with that, to be honest. I mean, not only did his news about him being alive it caused a bit of controversy because, well, particularly in the Philippines, because, you know, innocent people had died at the hands of Anoda and his team. Mm -hmm. um, but when he goes back to Japan, he is largely celebrated as a hero as he truly represented Japan and the Bushido spirit. But Japan had changed quite considerably 
in, yeah. in 30 odd, well, almost 30 years. So he did struggle. And also when you think about how they changed, right? They almost became assimilated into the West to a degree. So they were fighting against the West. They lost and now they were very Westernized. They have Westernized ideals. Mm -hmm. Obviously the culture's very different, but still they have these Westernized ideals, which is probably some of the things that they were fighting against. Yeah, and I think it was that the society or societal changes that happened he struggled with and actually he did leave the country um oh he did where did he go well we'll get on to that in just a second i wanted to tell you a little bit more about two other holdouts that were found okay around the time Mm -hmm. Uh, because i wanted to share the contrast because anoda was treated as this hero essentially and really had a positive reception but one guy called shoichi yokoi was found two years earlier Mm -hmm. after 26 years in hiding so still a, a fairly long time But he knew that the war ended in 1952. Oh, really? So what was his reason for holding out? Well, he wanted to remain hidden because he feared he'd be considered a deserter or he'd get court-martialed or maybe even executed because they'd lost the war. So he didn't really know what would happen. So he thought it was better that he would just hide. Okay, that's understandable. But I wonder if there was something very specific that made him believe that. I guess maybe that's what they were sort of taught. You might get captured if you surrender. Mm. Um, But I think people struggle to warm to them as much because he didn't represent Japanese honor in the same way, whereas at least Anoda was out there fighting, thinking that the war was still going on. That's why he was in the jungle. Mm. So Anoda, he technically isn't the last soldier found. Mm -hmm. Uh, The last man ever to be found was Tiro Nakamura, who lasted nine months more than Anoda. Mm-hmm. Um, and he also refused to believe that the war was over. So similar sort of mindset. But because he grew up in Taiwan, which was part of Japan's empire at the time, and wasn't part of Japan itself, um, that is why Anoda is considered the last Japanese holdout, sorry. Because it was part of the their empire. Even though it's not now. Yeah, let's, I don't know if I should say that again. Was that confusing? No, no, I understood it. So say it again just for because you'll be able to say, that, say it with more conviction now. So one other thing um, I should say, technically Anoda is not the last soldier as the last man ever to be found was Tiro Nakamura who lasted nine months more than Anoda. And he, like Anoda, refused to believe that the war was over. He, however, grew up in Taiwan, which was part of Japan's empire at the time. Um, So he wasn't from Japan himself, which is why he's not considered uh, like the last Japanese holdout. Right, yeah. That's interesting. I didn't know that Taiwan was not always part of China. Mm, At this particular time, yeah, Yeah. it was part of Japan. Because Nakamura was from Taiwan originally, he didn't receive the same warm reception as the other holdouts. Oh, really? What happened to him? Um, So by the time that he walked out of the jungle, history had kind of rendered him stateless because the Japanese empire was gone Mm -hmm. and Taiwan had now become part of the Chinese nationalist government. Right. And though Nakamura himself expressed a wish to be sent to Japan as he considered that his home country Mm -hmm. and who had been fighting for, it emerged he had no right to live there. Which is kind of sad. So what happened to him? Um, I'm not too sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I know that from what I read, you know, we are just scratching the surface here, Carl. Yeah, but that's a pretty big detail. Like, if he's got nowhere to go, where is he going to go? Um, I don't know. Oh, wait, I do know. I've, oh, got okay. it, I've got it just here. He didn't actually survive much longer. He only lived for a further four years and he died at 59. Um, So he spent half of his life in hiding. He was sort of rejected when he came out or Mm -hmm. certainly wasn't given the same reception. And yeah, then he died. So what was that all for? Yeah, what was it all for? That's Mm. the thing about war, right? What is it all for? What's it really good for? Absolutely nothing. Yeah. As a song said. Yeah, that sounds like, (laughs) I thought it was a Family Guy reference, but no. Things did end better for Anoda, however. The Japanese government offered him a large sum of money in back pay, but he refused all that. What? Why did he refuse it? That's his salary. He's owed that. Yeah, but I guess, again, this honor thing comes into it. 
Mm. Um, he received donations from people, but he gave them away. Really? Yeah. I guess he kind of felt maybe a little bit uncomfortable profiting off of this because, yes, he'd been doing all this sort of um, for his country, but I think he did feel a bit of remorse for some of the actions that he did do. Oh, really? That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, because I would think that maybe he refused all that back pay and also the donations as a way to further this way that he's revered. Like, mm. oh, like, yeah, we tried to give him money, but he said no. What a wonderful, amazing human he is. And that elevates you even more mm. as this incredible... Noble. Noble person. Yeah. He did find a way to kind of give back a little bit. So after he got found and he decided he didn't want to stay in Japan... He moved to a Japanese colony in Sao Paulo, Brazil, mm -hmm. where he became a cattle farmer. And in 1976, he married. Um, he did, though, return to Japan in 1984 after he grew tired of hearing of news stories of how he felt the Japanese youth were losing their way. Right. Um, one particular news story broke about a boy who murdered his parents. And Anoda felt so saddened to hear about this he was adamant that before war, or the war that he was involved in, this would have never happened as when a young adult had disagreements with their parents, they would leave home and become independent and they would grow as a person. Mm -hmm. So I think this is the bit where he was struggling with society because he was like, it's changed and people were becoming not as, I just don't know, I guess that they didn't have the same sort of Well, like you said, morals. they're losing their way. Yeah. So what he did is he opened up the Anoda Nature School, which was sort of like a, an Aww. educational youth camp. Yeah. So students or children would camp out in tents and would come face to face with nature, learning survival skills to essentially make them physically and mentally stronger. Mm -hmm. And he could impart his wisdom on the things that he had learned during his, you know, his survival days. Oh, that's nice. And he donates the money that he makes from the school back to Labang. Um, it's the equivalent of around 2 million yen that he'd earn and as a way of i guess giving back because of the trouble that he caused the island mm -hmm. wow he does he does need to take a bit of a salary <laughs> i'm sure he does take some right you know he's benefiting but i think he he appreciates the simpler life in some ways yeah 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 he also climbs one of the himalayan mountains in 1987 at the age of 65 wow when he learns that norio suzuki goes missing mm-hmm so, as I mentioned, Suzuki's goal was to find a Noda, a Panda, and then the Abominable Snowman. Yeah. In that order. Well, he found a Noda. Um, apparently, he found a Panda. Mm -hmm. But he then believes he finds the Abominable Snowman in 1975 from a distance. Mm -hmm. And so he goes back to the Himalayas in 1987, but he sadly dies. Oh, does he? Trying to locate um, the snowman. Anoda being the honourable man that he is, he wants to pay his respects because it's down to Suzuki that gave him a new life. Mm -hmm. He has a lot to thank him for. And so Anoda camped out three days after climbing 4,000 metres in the Himalayas, uh, close to where Suzuki's body was eventually found. And he makes a simple altar on the mountain where he prays for Suzuki. Aww. Anoda releases a book and there's even been a movie about him, which uh, will include links within the show notes if you're interested. He's been given many accolades for his work in the later years, and he lives a long life to the age of 91 before dying from complications of pneumonia in 2014. Oh, that's a shame. So it's not that long ago that he died then? Not really, but I am glad that whilst he spent 28 years in the jungle, he managed to have a good life afterwards. Yeah, and you said that he got married as well, so yeah. he moved out to Brazil with his wife. Yeah. So or he met her there. He met her there, I think, but... It just goes to show, yeah, he got a he got a really good reception. He managed to have a life afterwards. And it's a shame that maybe not everyone got celebrated in the same way or mm -hmm. had that success afterwards. Yeah. It still is that regret though, right? I don't know if I'd be able to live with that regret. That would mm. be difficult to come to terms with. You would come to terms with it because, of course, it's life and you want to continue to live. But after all those years, I still wouldn't be able to come to terms with it, especially when you mm. consider... What is it all for? And it makes you put it into perspective as you get older, like what is the meaning of life? Mm. Why, what is my purpose? And it sounds like for a long time, he was so convicted in his feelings and in what he felt was right or wrong. Mm. that ultimately, 
what is considered right or wrong can turn on a dime. One minute it can be, this is the just thing to do. The next thing is meaningless and pointless. Yeah. And that must do some crazy stuff to your brain. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's why he, I don't know, tried to find meaning in his later years to kind of give back and do something good to show that he'd learned something from it, I guess. And I guess what's nice is it's on his own terms, right? Mm. He's not being told this is the right thing to do. It sounds like he is saying, this is what I believe is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. I'm not being told that this is what honor is. He understands the value of relationships and people. And that's why he went to go set up the school because he understands that it's about you growing as a person and Mm. being respectful to your parents and find your own way in life. And so, yeah, that's, that's sad. What a nice guy. Yeah, really nice guy. Now, there have been rumors and possible sightings of other Japanese holdouts still hiding in the surrounding islands of Libang as recent as 2005. But this was thought to be a hoax because by this point, the men would have been in their 80s. And at that kind of age, you're not going to be surviving in the jungle, I would have thought. No, you've been eaten. You got a bad back, maybe your hips out, can't see, Yeah. eat a poisonous toad, you're dead. (laughs) <laughs> and so that most likely means that Hiro Onoda was indeed the last Japanese born holdout to be found, an honorable man that was both stubborn and loyal, which would serve him well during his 28 years and 210 days in hiding. Wow. Oh. Yeah, there we go. That is the story of Hiro Onoda, the last Japanese soldier. Wow, what an incredible story. Mm. Oh, thank you very much for that. It's good, isn't it? I um, Yeah, I really enjoyed researching that one because I had no idea until I stumbled upon it. Sure. So if I want to read more, what can I? where can I go? What can I look up? Well, there is a website dedicated to all the Japanese holdouts called wanpella.com. It's got a brief summary about all of them on there and other bits of information. So that's quite interesting. Um, there's the book by Hiro Inoda called No Surrender, My 30-Year War. And then the film 10,000 Nights in the Jungle, which again is sort of based on an odor. Wow. And is that how much it comes up to, 10,000 Nights? Yeah, I think it's over that, to be honest. Wow. I worked it out, but then there's leap years and I got confused. <laughs> I think you only add a few on there. Yeah, but like... 4, 8, 12, 16, 24, 30, it's like six days on there. Yeah, but did the leap year start before the war? Oh, or I don't up? know. <laughs> this is why I got confused. Sure. Anyway. Amazing. To the outro. Yeah, let's go. And so we come to the end of another episode of The Compendium, an assembly of fascinating and intriguing things. If you found today's episode both fascinating and intriguing, then we urge you to subscribe and leave us a review. Don't just stop there, though. Schedule our episodes to download automatically. Doing this not only ensures you're always in the loop, but also boosts our visibility, helping us to serve up even more captivating tales straight to your ears. You can also follow us on Instagram at The Compendium Podcast. Or visit our home on the web at thecompendiumpodcast.com. New episodes are released every Tuesday. And so until then, see ya. See you later. <laughs>